the show that inspires, educates, and innovates. You're listening to The Hem Chat. I'm your host, Derek Cross, and welcome to the show. Hey, welcome back, everybody. I am Derek Cross. I am delighted to be here today. It's the middle of June, and the show we're going to talk about today is about genetics. We have a genetics specialist with us today, and uh, we're going to go over some genetics that is vital for you guys to be looking at into this grow season and where to get them, how to get them, who to talk to, who to trust, who to believe. And it is just crazy, crazy world of hemp. So there's so much to balance, so much to understand, and so much to learn. That's the part of the hemp chat here. Last week episode, we had Stephen Cutter and his mission, Hemp for the Future, going and growing on down in Puerto Rico. So my hat's off to him. Can't wait to get down there to do some education and helping people Uh, find their why. And once you find your why, you want to be able to have the right tools to get to your why. So if you have growing practices under your belt and you need a a specialized genetic to get to where you want to be, or you want to work to develop some genetics, maybe you can reach out to our next guest. That is Jeremy Kletke from Davis Hemp Farms out in Oregon. Uh, That's our featured guest here today. And Davis Hemp Farms are doing some amazing, amazing work with genetics. Past four or five years, they have over 30, 60 years of experience in the field in hemp and cannabis. They are breeders on terpene wrench CBD varieties, um, multiple varieties for you to work with. And really get the education behind you and understanding how to grow this. And risk mitigation is huge in this hemp space. And this is one of your risk mitigators, okay? When we're dealing with compliance factors, you go hot in your crop and you're done. There's nothing you can do other than to look at your stakeholders and your investment and see it go down the drain. So we want to, at the Hemp Chat here, provide you with the expertise and professionals in the space. We want you to get the information um, from these guys that have actually dedicated their lives and their missions to provide good genetics to the people that are growing. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. And as always, I want to shout out to our sponsors and give them their two cents in return for everything they've done for us here at the Hemp Chat and our donors. I want to thank them all, our special donations that keep coming into the show. It helps with our programming and our sponsors from Tiny Hemp Houses to Eco Envision to Canaf Partners USA to Colorado Hemp Tea. Then we have HD Innovates, proud sponsors, coming out with some really cool hemp products out to the space man wow what a time to be alive it is so cool um seeing everything developing in front of our eyes and how fast this uh industry is really blossoming and blooming so all the people in the space whether you're making foods from hemp um getting out there educating about all the beneficials of cbd and or cannabis my hat's off to you Thank you for all my past and present and future partners out there in the space and everybody around the globe that's tuning in. Man, every week I'm just uh, impressed with our numbers and our our fans that are going and growing out there around the globe. And I thank you for tuning in and hearing about uh, the education and innovations that are coming in this space. And I'm always enlightened to bring on new talent and guests. So if you want to be a a guest on the show, go to www.thehempchat.com. Hit the contact us button there, or you can send me a a direct message on the Hemp Chat Facebook page. We're out there on social media. I know you guys are. 
Find us out on YouTube, like our stuff, subscribe to our stuff. We appreciate that. Our goal for the HemChat Facebook page is to increase from our current follower status, which we keep going up and up every week, quicker and quicker. It's for you guys to keep sharing our stuff and and share our HemChat podcast with your uh, invite your friends over to our page on the Facebook page. We appreciate it. That helps us grow. And uh, feel free to donate. If you have an episode you want us to talk about or you have questions and and need answers, let us know. That's what we're here for. We appreciate it. Now, stay tuned for Jeremy Kletke of Davis Hemp Farms. And when you call him, I just want to add this. When you call him, he's going to give you guys a 15% discount. That's a huge discount for your seed genetics right now if you mention the hemp chat. Let him know Derek Cross sent you. And they will take special care of you there. We greatly appreciate you guys listening and uh, appreciate everything that you're learning about this plant. And most importantly, being good to your neighbor, love thy neighbor, build your communities, collaborate, and, and just be better overall. I love you guys. In Hemp We Trust, enjoy this episode of the Hemp Chat. You're listening to The Hemp Chat, a podcast that inspires and educates utilizing agricultural hemp. We're here to provide meaningful content for you to pursue your passions. My name is Derek Cross, and I'm an educator in the field of hemp. I'm sitting down with others so that they can discuss their lessons that they have learned and their experience utilizing hemp in their fields, impacting their community, and helping others develop and craft their skills and giving you the knowledge to be healthier and happier. And we are planting seeds of wellness for the people in the planet. So go ahead, plant it. Hey, welcome back, everybody. We are here on the Hem Chat. Today, we are going to learn a little bit more about genetics. And we have a wonderful guest um, joining us for Oregon from Davis Hemp Farms, or Davis Farms, excuse me. Jeremy Kletke is going to be here talking about his experience uh, over 29 years plus in the space, and he can elaborate a little bit more about where he came from in the cannabis sector, and we're going to ask him about a lot of questions as far as compliance and education, and We're going to want to learn more about these genetics that they have and possess and why you want to really look at um, getting certified varieties of hemp and or cannabis and why does that play a major role. So, uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Derek. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, Please tell us a little bit about your background, your experience, and what got you into this crazy, wonderful world of hemp. You bet. You bet. So as a youth, I had the opportunity to travel a little bit and saw pretty quickly that that, uh, uh, cannabis was part of our our culture for a long time. Um, The hash culture has been around for millennia. That immediately piqued my interest as to how this plant evolved parallel to us and started this long journey that I've been on since I was about 19 years old. I'm 48 years old at this point. Um, Led me to work with the Swiss government in the late 90s, producing at field scale CBD and THC one-to-ones, and then opportunities in Holland working in glass houses, and then on to the Czech Republic uh, until about 2007 when I landed back in the States and um, started into the medical cannabis world here in Oregon, had the opportunity to operate under that regulatory structure. And um, we were drawn to, naturally drawn to CBD even at that time and became known as the uh, premier producers in the state of Oregon under the medical program of uh, ratios of one to one, two to one, 10 to one, and 20 to one CBD to THC varieties, which all have a a plethora of benefits, a plethora of benefits to human health. Um, and that led us into um, some policy work in the state that, that got us involved in the hemp program. And it was just natural. There weren't a lot of good uh, high CBD genetics in the hemp space at the time we started. And so we started down the path of identifying what germplasm was available and developing it and getting it into the market so that we could provide farmers with a tool to uh, engage in this new and unique crop that we're all uh, involved in these days. 
Oh yeah, that's that's great. And Oregon has been uh, primarily behind Colorado and Washington. Oregon, California have been primarily the leaders in the space. So when we go back to looking at hemp and cannabis, could you tell our audience a little bit more? Maybe be a little bit more. Um, give them a little bit more information on the ratios: the thirty to one, uh, three to one. What? Can you kind of elaborate on that, please? You bet, you bet. So when we when we talk about those ratios, obviously these are the the concentrations of those two primary cannabinoids, CBD and THC. So when we speak about ratios in the hemp space, that's specifically the two cannabinoids we're addressing. And the reason is pretty obvious that we have this 0.3 threshold uh, that we're trying to stay below for total THC compliance. And of course, we'd like to see the the the, the highest quantity of CBD. So we're looking for that greatest ratio spread. And so when you mentioned you just referenced the 30 to 1 mark, that 30 to 1 mark kind of seems to be the pinnacle right now as far as what we're able to um, get as a spread of a ratio between CBD and THC. What ends up happening is that it seems to me that as we start to pull the CBD up uh, at 30 to 1, the THC starts to rise with it and they just kind of pull up um, in unison so that we've hit that spread. And I, and I will say we're working on some anomalies now in-house that we're hitting 34 and 35 to 1 across a whole population, not just in a, you know, an anomaly, just a, a single plant. So we're breaking that code a little bit. But right now, when we speak about 30 to 1, fundamentally, you're talking about the ratio of THC, the maximum ratio of CBD to THC that you're going to see in a type 3 hemp plant. Okay, and so with that being said, we look at um, the big thing for me and what I try to communicate to people just getting into the space is uh, being compliant. And uh, what Jeremy's talking about is trying to stay under that threshold of three-tenths of percent or less. Now, compliance is vital in this space. And working with geneticist specialists like Jeremy and the Davis Farms, uh, that's what you're going to get. So can you tell us about the USDA certification and or certifications and maybe elaborate about generations of, um, of developing these cultivars? You bet. Absolutely. So, you know, first touching on the, the new interim final rule which is when we talk about this compliance issue, compliance being um, having a plant that stays below the threshold of 0.3 total THC, we're addressing the, the new USDA interim final rule. Um, we've been operating, a lot of the states have been operating under pilot programs, which have allowed uh, the geneticists to develop varieties that are only taking into consideration the Delta-9 component of the THC, not the other three uh variants of the THC. So now that we have this new IFR, they're looking at the total THC instead of just the Delta 9. And it is going to be a 0.3 threshold. Along with that comes some, you know, unique new components to that law that turns out. So you have this measurement of uncertainty, they're calling it in the IFR, which means that your labs have some variability to them when they do your COA. So they're going to give you a little fudge room and Generally, that's going to, it looks like it's going to be about uh, four hundredths or five hundredths, half of a tenth. So as, like, the point is, is that what I'm trying to get at is that if you have a, a 0.33 or a 0.34 and your measurement of uncertainty in your state by your labs is a, is a, a 0.05, now you're going to be compliant. So you do have a little bit of wiggle room there, but the other side of this is that above 0.5, it actually becomes criminal. So they've created a, a new caveat that says, look, if below 0.3, you're fully legal. If you're between 0.3 and 0.5, you're in a, a position where you can have a pathway to mitigation. So they can just embargo or destroy your crop. Um, and if you're above 0.5 now, you actually are, are looking at some federal charges once this uh, once this, or, or potentially state charges, once this uh, interim final rule is implemented, and it looks like it will be implemented um, on, I'm sorry, it will become final rule on November 1st of 2021. Okay, so compliance is key, people, and you may have heard a term in Jeremy's language just now of CIA or C of A. Uh, that's a certificate of analysis. So, how often are you testing these varietals? And on your tried and true process, I mean, you got you got these producers over and over. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that process? 
Yeah, well, I mean, what, what I'd say is that you touch on testing, so te- testing and certificates of analysis, so look at, looking for cannabinoid potency. And a lot of these people are talking about testing early and testing often so that, and, and when I say these people, I mean other geneticists in the space, other seed producers in the space will talk about, and, and compliance being the crux of the issue, but the way to stay compliant, testing often and testing early. Uh, what, what they're not acknowledging there is that you need a plant to go to full maturity in order to to gain all the expressions of it to and and mostly just to gain the the full hard weight out of the field you know you can lose up to 25 percent of your hard weight just in uh, harvesting two weeks early so you know something that goes to full maturity is absolutely what you're looking for and you need to be looking for varieties that are going to stay below 0.3 at full maturity so so watch out for test early and test often it seems to be a common line in the in the space these days absolutely and if you're not out there doing these tests um you uh you're probably not on a good path of success and you, i want to ask a question as far as when you when you go around and you order seeds from you if you're growing them in oregon what does a farmer have to take in consideration in let's say uh i don't know any state uh florida so we're going cross country diagonal what do we have to do special with these genetics if somebody were to purchase them from you? Well, the first thing you want to do when you're talking to your geneticist is you want to ask them about the, the plant's agronomic traits, meaning are they good for your bioregion or microclimate? Um, a lot of these genetics are being sold just on cannabinoid content, and we aren't really getting into the details of whether or not the plant will produce in my region. So that's the first thing you want to talk about is, hey, is this plant going to be viable in Florida? Uh, if you bred it in Oregon, how is it viable in Florida? And and then, you know, from there, I guess we talk about the regulatory structure a little bit. So as far as moving seed to Florida, we have to have a, a, a license to produce the seed in the state where we operate. And then, of course, we have to have a license to sell the seed in every state that we're, we're operating in. And those come with some requirements, um, in, including seed labeling requirements. These are the kind of um, barriers to entry that that will be good identifiers to you guys purchasing seed out there as far as, um, you know, who's a fly by night and who's here to stay. So definitely look for people that are licensed and registered in your state and certainly make sure they're licensed and registered to produce seed or breeds the state where they're operating out of. Yeah. And Hey, um, listeners, if you go to Davis hemp farms.com, you can see, uh, everything that they offer on their website. Um, you can learn about them. They have a blog and education, and they have um, a catalog of what type of cultivars that they have done successfully and um, in their developments. So I want to ask you from uh, somebody that's just joining us, learning about hemp from the first time, can you explain the difference between feminized, non-feminized, regular seed, and so on? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the cannabis plant is a unique plant in that it's a dioecious plant. So the plant can be male and female. And in, in the field, when you're talking about hemp, you're really not interested in the male for, for cannabinoid production. I mean, if you're doing grain production, you're going to need some pollen to help you seed the plants and create grain. But when we've got into this uh, cannabinoid production or CBD or CBG is, is a new one you're hearing about, um, we're, we're definitely um, – uh, uh, Excuse me, talk, talking about, um, I lost my train of thought, Derek, if you want to give me that one. Oh, yeah, that's all right. You were, you were just kind of going over the different uh, varietals and the oh, feminization. Yes, feminized about- and non-feminized and males are no good and women rule the world. <laughs> that's exactly, well, that's the way it is. <laughs> So, so anyway, what I, where I lost that is that we've moved into creating feminized seeds. So for, for the field scale, because the CBD producer does not need the male plant, we've worked really hard to develop technologies to feminize the seed. So if you're out there buying seed, I think, Derek, what, what you're trying to say to the new listener is watch out for uh, what they call a regular seed or a non-fem seed. And if you're buying feminized seed, you know, that's not an on-off switch. Realize that. That's not 100% or 0% somebody saying feminized or non-feminized. There's a ratio there. So you're going to want to look at the feminization rates. You're going to want to make sure that the company you're buying from has good third-party analytics on their fem rates. And then they've done them reasonably comprehensive so that you're not looking at, say, 15 
sites or 15 examples to show you 100% feminized. That's easy to do. You, you know, for example, we run 1,272 um, independent sites to get our fem rates per batch. Wow, that's impressive. That's that's great. Um, you mentioned working with agronomists when people purchase your genetics from you. Um, what can you elaborate? Why do people want to work with the agronomist uh, utilizing these genetics versus if they're out there in their fields and get just getting started? Well, I mean, there, there's a, inevitably a learning curve to this plant. Again, it's a complex plant, and, and any farmer knows every time you move into a new crop, even row crop farmers, there's a little bit of change that you have to do. Sometimes it's just implements, uh, what looks up to your PTO and how you tow it through the field. And, and a lot of times there are other nuances to the nutrition, to the, the harvest time, to what makes a mature plant. Um, so having somebody on deck with you that can support you through that is, is a really good idea. And that's a, it's a good moment for me to say, Derek, this is one of the things that we understand is that this being a space in its infancy and us having the experience that we do on site. So our, in our staff, we have over 60 years worth of cannabis experience. We're pretty high touch. Uh, we're all about making sure that a farmer has the answers that they need. So when you purchase seed from our company, you, it comes with an understanding that you may be a new farmer and there's nothing you know wrong with that. Let us give you a hand. Let us help you with the nuances and, and the unique nature of, of growing this plant. Oh, uh, that's for sure. The the agronomy in taking consideration of all the nutrients that you have to provide. Um, what are some of your What are some of your clients seeing for um, water usage and fertilization? Well, so your so water usage is generally baked. Ba- based on something called PKT or peak evapotranspiration rates. And those are going to vary. It's going to vary dramatically depending on soil type, uh, what the temperature is outside, what the humidity is outside. So your PKT is going to be quite variable depending on where you're growing. But what is interesting across the board is the plant generally needs a lot less water than many crops that we're growing. Matter of fact, it it needs a lot less input in general. The input cost is low. Uh, We're currently in a space where, you know, speaking to a farm the the input cost per acre is higher than a lot of crops out there right but the input cost on your actual nutrition is very very low and your input cost on water is very very low oh that's awesome so when i'm sitting here and i'm just getting started in the field uh for the first time not knowing should i grow these varietals outdoor or should I grow them indoor? Do you have different varieties that work better indoor versus outdoor that in your experience in your region up there in Oregon? Well, we certainly do. But what, you know, generally speaking, you could take any of the varieties that we have from outdoor and put them indoor because as soon as you move them indoor, you're, you're coddling them a little bit. You're giving them an, an, an edge, a leg up by removing them from the exposure that they would be under out in the field, you know, in hail storms or, or rainstorms or wind or heavy exposure. Um, you know, but uh, I, I would say we certainly have some that lean better for indoor production than others. Uh, I think the one thing you see across the board is you're going to see a little better cannabinoid production and you're certainly going to see better terpene production inside because those are highly volatile uh, compounds. So just while we're touching on it, anybody that's looking to grow smokable, uh, keep that in mind. Your terpenes are what really makes a quality smokable flower. And if you're you know, not careful about how you deal with the plant, those are just highly volatile compounds and they disappear very quickly. So just how you handle the plant and how you grow the plant and how you protect it has a lot to do with your terpene retention at the end of this and do you uh do you grow uh primarily for cbd i know you mentioned on some other different varietals i'm sure as a geneticist you're working on a lot of different uh cultivars for different um cannabinoid profiles but is it primarily cbd or or do you have some cbg customers coming to you and other people wanting to work with you and develop new, new uh, specific, you know, there's 80 plus different cannabinoids here. So That's uh, right. what, what do you see coming in down the pipeline? All puns intended. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually think that's a really good question because as we start to look more and more at independent cannabinoids, I think there's a, there's a division in the space and as far as the science goes. And um, there are single molecule or single compound 
you know, people. And then there are people that believe in the, the complex of compounds. And so I'd say as a breeder, what really we're really focused on is moving into something that has a, a, a comprehensive and complex set of, of cannabinoids, flavonoids, and terpenes. Um, it, it, meaning that we'd like to see small amounts of minors across the board. Um, and then because of the way the receptor system works for the human body, its primary recept- receptor sites in the endogenous cannabinoid system are set up for uh, CBD and THC. So CBD CB1 for THC, CB2 for for CBD. And so I I think we're going to be at a point where, uh, I mean, we're going to evolve to a point where we see that, you know, primarily driving those two compounds towards the endogenous cannabinoid system with a whole entourage of camp compounds circling them is where we're going to get the highest efficacy. Um, at least that's my humble opinion. So when you see us, we're really not breeding in one direction as far as a CBG or a CBN. Um, and, and I appreciate there are a lot of breeders out there that I think are leaning that way. Um, but we'd really like to see something that, again, has a, has a broad spectrum across the board. I just believe in the long run, those will be the things that we see have the highest efficacy and the greatest benefit to the human body. When you're developing these varietals for CBD, CBG, CBN, whatever you're going to develop, um, especially in the CBD market and where the market has been, uh, the percentage of CBD has ranged anywhere from a low two to three, four, five, six percent all the way as high as, I don't know, um, 20%, you know, 15, 20%. Can you elaborate on that? And it, it, what, what do people, because people get all this information, I need the highest and the best. That is not always the case, is it? No, it's not. So again, we go back to that entourage of compounds. And what we've realized in the THC side of the cannabis space, which, you know, frankly, is a little bit more developed than the the CBD side. Um, You know, hemp has been around for a very long time, but hemp for CBD production, it, it is relatively new. Um, and what we've realized in that in that THC space is that it's the entourage of compounds that absolutely have the impact on the human body. And so give you an example. I mean, just, you know, telling it how it is that through the pipeline, as you say, um, we're talking about, you know, a situation where you can have a 26 or 27 percent THC variety on the shelf in a dispensary. Right. And you, you can do a, a you know, a basically a blind a blindfolded study and you can give a guy like a 17 or 18 percent flower that has the right entourage of terpenes around it, like our OG flowers. And um, those will have a greater impact on them. I mean, straight up, the people will just tell you that this one has got to be more potent than this one, and they're completely flip-flopped. So that has led us in the direction of understanding, and the connoisseurs in the cannabis space know this, that it's not about the highest THC content. And I think as the CBD space gets more refined, we're going to start to learn that it really isn't about the highest CBD content. It is absolutely about, other than for extraction. I mean, if you're trying to get liters of oil out of a field of one type of cannabinoid, now now it is about potency there, right? But when you're talking about true impact on the human body, I think we're, we're all going to realize pretty quickly that uh, single molecule, um, you know, medicine is not the way to go. Single compound, fractioning compound is not the best way to go for efficacy. And I think that leads us to even understanding further that, hey, that CBD content can fool you. It can be misleading. It, it very well can. And in this space, if we look at, and when I'm on stage and I do my um, education out in the public, I let people know that we evolved with this plant. We didn't have all the technology and all the data to, I mean, sure, there was probably breeders back in the day that were doing and mixing things together. However, um, we just were forager gatherers right and so we yeah. ate this we ate this and it worked and doctors back then or medicine men back then just prescribed hey you need this herb this herb and this salve and this and they didn't really know the potency factors really mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. now we are just drilled in you know like you're saying the um if you're a connoisseur of uh, plant material some guys want really high amounts and some people don't and i believe that people do over medicate in this field and i believe you have to be a responsible consumer and the way i seen cbd especially and or thc 
people are over consuming in my opinion. And I've been a connoisseur for many, many years myself. And a little bit goes a long way, people. <laughs> of the right stuff, especially. Of the yeah. right stuff. So I agree, Eric. <laughs> when your clients come to you, how are um how how do you handle um what's your SOP as far as how they come to purchase seed from you? Well, essentially, you just make an inquiry, and there are several ways to do that. You can call us directly, um, and my phone number is on the website. As a matter of fact, I'm going to pick up the phone nine times out of ten when you call the company. We're a decent-sized company, but like I said, we're still pretty high-touch. But you make an inquiry either through the website or direct to the phone, um, and then we're going to reply, You know, obviously ask you some qualifying questions. We'd like to know what region you're in. We'd like to know maybe a little bit about your soil type. Um, and then from there, we're going to help I, you generally – suggest a few of the varieties that we have. So we're offering seven. We released six early on. We have a seventh variety that's just been released uh, in the last month here. It took us, again, it takes years to prove these things out through process. Um, and, and from there, we'll, we'll, you know, get you lined out on what your quantity is and what the varieties that we believe are there. We'll send you a seed purchase agreement. Um, once uh, you've received that, you sign the seed purchase agreement and pretty much immediately ship you seed. And we're pretty prompt about that. Uh, we don't like the male guy holding on to your seed. We have a high viability. We wouldn't want him leaving in the sunshine 110 degrees or something for some hours. So we ship the seed quickly to you. And, and from there, that's really just the beginning with us. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys, I think they sell you a seed and they walk away. We have a deep understanding of what we created here. These are our progeny. These are my children and we know them better than just about anybody. So we're happy to engage at that point um, and start to support you. We did produce uh, a webinar series this year, which I think is worth vi you know visiting. You can go to either YouTube, Davis Hemp Farms channel, or you can go to our website and find them. We, we didn't make a tag that you had to do anything to get them. Uh, we want people to have them so they're accessible, but the, they're on total THC compliance, um, you know, on how to navigate the space and the interim final rule. And then the third one we put out is really about germination and field hardening. So it's really there to help farmers to understand understand what to do with the seeds once they get them and how to get them germinated and into the field properly. Uh, we see a lot of consultants out there charging, you know, unfair amounts of money to teach these guys simple things that, that uh, we're happy to share with them. I'm not trying to undermine anybody's ability to, to make a living, but we think this stuff should be common knowledge and should be available to a farmer once they make a seed purchase. Well, yeah, you want somebody to be able to uh, help you walk through the field and, and get you going and have the right um, information for what you're growing and doing. Do you see a lot of guys growing, gals growing in this space that are, um, do, you, do you advise them to uh, space out or do you actually have varieties that you can go into more of a, a tight, more knit row of approach. Uh, most of the CBD farms are growing, you know, anywhere from two to five feet spacing, um, allowing the maximum, um, uh, what am I saying? As far as yield the spacing and their grid and their per acre yields uh, to determine that. But do you see a lot more going with smaller spacing? Yeah, I think we're moving that direction. And, I, and I'd say that we bred in that direction. You know, for us, it's not about a planting density. It's about a, 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 a yield per acre. I yeah. mean, if it's bushels per acre, or pounds per acre, or kilograms of, of oil per acre. And so we're trying to get that maximum yield per acre. And mm -hmm. a lot of our breeding has led towards a higher planting density. So we've bred plants that have a, a longer internodal spacing. They'll have a thinner leaf blade structure, so a slightly more sativa leaf blade structure. And that allows for a higher planting density while still getting good light penetration down to the bottom of the plant. But I, I will go back and say that this is something that I hear a lot of people, a lot of the, the, the breeders and, and seed sellers will give you a set planting density. And I, I want to tell you that that is a lot based on your planting time. Uh, your planting density is going to increase as the season gets later so that you can get the same yield per acre. And this is another thing that I want to put out there that we're working on for farmers. So I'm from ag. 
you know, I understand the, the farmer's issues and their concerns. And as the season gets later, obviously their seed cost goes up per acre. So the, the input cost that they're going to have to deal with per acre is going to increase. And, and that can increase sometimes, say you're planting in early June from 1,700 or 1,800 plants per acre to planting in mid-July, which is not too late to plant. And you're planting, you know, more like 2,500 or 2,700 per acre. You know, that directly impacts the farmer when we're talking about a dollar a seed purchase price. So this is one of the things that Davis Farms is working on is coming up with a cost per acre uh, in our farming network, meaning that, you know, if you come on later, uh, we're going to still, uh, uh, you know, give you the same cost per acre if it's a twenty-two hundred or a two thousand dollar cost per acre for seed. Whether you're you're getting the, the you know twenty-two hundred seeds or two thousand seeds, or whether you're getting thirty-four hundred seeds, we understand that that input cost has a lot to do with uh, what makes this work for a farmer. When we talk about varieties and the different offerings you have um, from uh, different, well, different varieties, so. If I get into this and I've seen things on the internet, I see all different kinds of hemp and cannabis out there. You know, what, what, what is some of the yields that most of your varietals are performing at? Are they, you know, a quarter pound, half pound, three pounds, nine pounds? How many, what does somebody usually expect to receive? So again, that's going to be depending on the time you get the plant in the ground. There's some variability there, but we give people a baseline number and I'm really careful about uh, over over promise and under deliver. That's something that we don't believe in and never want to do. I don't want to leave a farmer at the end of the season going, well, you said this and we're here, you know? So what what we say is we say usually 2000 to 2,500 pounds an acre. That's extremely conservative though. I will be straight with you that we've seen um, plants here in Oregon yield up to five pounds per plant at a 1700 plant um, density. So that's going to give you a lot more yield per acre than what you're talking about right there. So I mean, that's like 9,000 pounds an acre. Um, but but good, good number is 2,000 pounds for a baseline. And if your ROI works and, and you can make everything cash flow at, at 2,000 pounds an acre, that's a, you know, a, a good entry point and an easy target to hit with our varieties. <laughs> Well, very good. I think what you're doing is great. Um, we talk about people trying, you know what I've seen, uh, and I'm, I'm disheartened by it. Everybody has jumped into the hemp space. I mean, I feel guilty because I've been out there um, advocating and educating and inspiring many to get into this space. <laughs> and it's Don't just kind of like fast tracked in. And now I have people calling me all the time. I got into this. I I got seed and now I don't know what to do with my crop and and people sure. go into a lot of things without a plan. And first and foremost, uh, listeners, if you're going to get into this uh, and you're really going to dive deep into this, work with people that, like Jeremy at, at Davis Hemp Farms uh, that know what they're doing. The genetics are key. We have people that have started and then they go ahead and develop and they try to crossbreed. They get two things and then they're trying to sling seed out there that, hey, this is a new uh, a new cultivar, blah, blah, blah. They have not done the research. They have not done the years of generations to make sure that these plants are what they are going to be. So you've got to work with professionals that have years and time invested in this, not for them, but for you. Uh, risk mitigation at all levels in this space. It's highly volatile and you need to work with professionals that know what they're doing and can allow you to have the information needed to be successful in this space. And that's what Jeremy and his staff have done out there in Oregon. And my hat's off to you guys for doing what you're doing. Okay. Misinformation will sink you and people have been burned in this space and we're we're bringing things up a notch, and it's it's always education number one. But you have to work with individuals that know what the hell they're doing in the space. For sure, for sure. And and genetics will be the single most important decision these guys make. And we've seen too many people get burned on bad genetics. So you're absolutely right, Derek. He's in this new space. There's a lot of snake oil. Stick with the people who know what they're doing. They're few and far between, but you can certainly source them. I appreciate you, Derek, very much for getting us out here. Yeah, no, greatly appreciate it. Uh, and all the varieties that you have, um, do you have um, 
do you have like hundreds of pounds, thousands of pounds? What type of uh, amounts do you have? So if somebody calls in and they're, they're wanting seed now, do you have a lot available or? Yeah, so we're, we, we are a relatively boutique producer. You know, um, I see a lot of guys scale and try to produce hundreds of millions of seeds right out of the gate. And we're a little bit different than that. I don't like putting the cart before the horse. I like to tenuously enter into anything. So I'll be honest, we, we only produce about 13,000 acres worth of seed a year. That's a drop in the bucket for what's going to be out there in the marketplace. Um, and we produce very high quality seed at that scale. But yes, we're in a position where we don't have a ton of seed. Uh, we can certainly help a number of farmers out. But yeah, we generally sell out every season. Oh, good. That's that's good to know. I, I like that. Um, and then you can stay more consistent on what you have in your offerings. Um, yep. The other question is, do you sell just seed or do you have clones or starters or what else do you have for clients? So we primarily do the feminized seed and then we support the farmers to get their infrastructure going and, and germinate the plants and, and harden them on site. However, we do for a set of our farmers, we do a lot. We have infrastructure specifically for seedlings. So we do a lot of germination for our farmers and provide them uh, the seed starts for the field. So we're in central Oregon. Um, if you're within about a 600 mile radius of us, then we can deliver you or work it out for you to get uh, seedlings as well as. Okay, good. Well, you know, uh, Jeremy, give us a lot of information. I sure would uh, have a list of other questions for sure. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask you that you may want to get out there? No, no, I, I just, I guess I want to, you know, take the opportunity to, to let everybody know that, you know, we're, we're working with Derek here to try and offer something to the podcast uh, attendees or, or viewers. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to offer a 15% discount uh, to anybody that, that mentions the podcast um, oh. to us. They call us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, just to show our support for the people that are in your network here. So just keep that in mind that we'd, we'd like to extend a 15% discount on all purchases, no matter what the quantity that anybody who calls and tells us that they saw us on the hip chat. Well, well, thank you for that. And listeners, um, take, take that um, from Jeremy. Take his advice. Get out there. Make the call. Um, get, get to know them. Even if you don't get the seed right now, get the education, get the information, start working with guys like Jeremy in the space due to, you need to start somewhere and it's all about the right information and education. Build that, build that relationship with your, uh, seed providers, you know, uh, your geneticist is, is one of the most important out there. So thank you, Jeremy, for being part of the hemp chat and y'all go ahead and let them know that you heard it on the hemp chat and, and go out to davishempfarms.com and get a hold of them. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate it very much. I, I really appreciate the time more than I can, more than I can say. So you have a wonderful day and everybody um, good luck and happy hemping. That's right. Happy, happy hemping everybody and stay compliant. <laughs> yes, please do. Come see us. To you and the seed and genetics. Uh, they are doing some great work here in the space. And I just can't thank you guys enough for wanting to learn more about hemp, being a part of this industry. Having the knowledge is what we're here to provide, right? Giving you the knowledge to be successful. Planting seeds of wellness for the people on the planet. That's why we wanted to have Jeremy on for you guys. Uh, you have to have the seed in order to be able to plant the seed of uh, growth in this country. So all I can do is say thank you. Uh, you guys go ahead, Davis Hemp Farms. Click on there. Get your 15% uh, discount. Okay, guys? Uh, let them know that I sent you from the hemp chat. You guys keep being better um, through everything that's going on with COVID and everything. Just love one another. Uh, be out there. Support one another. Learn from each other. Thrive to be better. Okay, guys? And as always, thank you for your time and being part of the Hemp Chat. You just listened to the Hemp Chat, the show that inspires, educates, and innovates 
utilizing agricultural hemp. Thanks for joining our mission, planting seeds of wellness for the people and the planet. Go ahead, plant it.